Good evening, everyone. Welcome students, faculty, staff, and all members of Meredith community. Thank you for supporting tonight's guest lecture, Ghost Forest, Symbols of Climate Change and Resilience, by Dr. Marcelo Ardon and Dr. Melinda Martinez. I am Madeline Conley, Vice President of Angels for the Environment. Angels for the Environment and the Summer Reading Program couldn't be more excited to sponsor tonight's event. With the connection of the Summer Reading Program, uh, discussing climate change, we thought this was the perfect opportunity to bring these speakers in. The theme of this year's summer reading program was Climate Conversations, Women at the Forefront, which brings awareness to the issues that are at the core of our club's mission. Angels for the Environment aims to spread awareness of critical environmental issues, such as climate change, to the Meredith community. I hope you all enjoy our speakers tonight. Now, Professor Emeritus Janice Swab will introduce our honored guest speakers. With us tonight, Marcelo Ardon, Associate Professor in the College of Natural Resources, Department of Forestry and Environmental Resources at Mississippi North Carolina State University. He received his BA in, at Gettysburg College in Biology and Environmental Science, his PhD at the University of Georgia in Ecology, one of the finest ecology schools in the nation, he completed his postdoctoral research at Duke University in biogeochemistry. He came to NTSU in 2016 from East Carolina, where our own Amanda Powell in the biology department uh, worked under him and received her master's degree. I can tell you a secret. She was his first graduate student. To date, he has more than 48 publications, according to my count, which is probably low. Many of them are open access, and you too can go and read them free of charge. Much of his work has been supported by grants. I'm going to give you just a couple of examples. He has an LTREB, that stands for Long Term Research in Environmental Biology. Uh, from the National Science Foundation uh, granting program. It supported his early work in Costa Rica. In 2016, he received an NSF Career Award that has supported his ghost forest work. I can tell you that that is a prestigious award. In 2020, he received the, uh, the NS NCSU Graduate School's Outstanding Graduate Mentor Award. He's worked with middle school and high school teachers to turn their research into classroom curricula. He's recently been interviewed about his research on CNN. His work has been featured in the Washington Post and he's been covered on WUNC Public Radio. His latest achievement is his collaboration with a large international group that was featured in a cover in September on, uh, the, as you can see, the magazine Science. It was featured, I repeat, on the cover. This doesn't happen, but it happened to Dr. Ardon. Very rare. With him tonight is Melinda Martinez, who received her PhD under his direction in 2021 and is currently Mendenhall postdoctorate research ecologist, a very prestigious position at the U.S. Geological Survey. She was integral to his work on ghost forests, as you will hear tonight. She received in 2022 the Sulzman Award for Outstanding graduate paper given at the Ecological Society of America National Meeting. If I tried to tell you about all the work on the ghost forests and all the other research that Dr. Ardon has been involved in, he and Dr. Martinez would have no time left to tell you about their exciting and interesting work on the topic of this evening, ghost forests symbols of climate change 
and resilience. Thank you for coming, Dr. Erdogan and Dr. Martinez. Hello, thank you for that wonderful introduction. Uh, my name is Melinda, and uh, like was stated, I will be talking to you all about Ghost Forest. Uh, but I'll also be talking to you guys a little bit about my journey on to becoming a wetland ecologist because it's not something that happened overnight. And so I am originally from Dallas, Texas, um, and my journey began uh, at when I started my undergraduate degree at University of Texas, uh, and I majored in marine and freshwater biology. Uh, but that's not exactly what I started off as. Uh, I was actually a math major when I started, uh, and then by the time I was a junior, I realized I didn't actually really want to do math, and I was looking through the curriculum, and I saw that we had a marine biology program, and I thought that was way more exciting than doing math my entire life, <laughs> and it has been very exciting. Uh, and so after I did my bachelor's, I did, oh actually, during my undergrad, I did um, a field research a study abroad trip in Okemo, which is on the Yucatan Peninsula. And so there I got my first experience in research uh, in seagrass ecosystems. Um, and so from there I got to know what research is and I was hooked basically. And so I applied for a graduate school, uh, but I did defer for a year. Um, and then I eventually started school at uh, Texas A&M University. Uh, where I did my master's in environmental science. And so in Corpus Christi, um, I got the chance to do research in salt marshes. And so these are, um, oh, very true to its name, these are areas that are very salty. And so these are fresh or salt marshes that are located on the backside of the Bear Islands of Texas. And so in the top photo, you see some of the vegetation that can be found uh, in salt marshes. So what you see uh, in black mangroves here. Um, these are some of these woody shrub species that are commonly found uh, in Texas. Uh, and then among the, the mangroves are um, marsh grasses, which are called spartinum. And so in the photo below is what we call tidal flats. And so these are areas where there's very little or to no vegetation. And this is because um, the tide goes in and out in this area. And so it's really hard for vegetation to stabilize. And so as part of my master's work, I was looking at sediment accretion rates along different uh, types of habitat. So looking at low marsh areas versus high marsh um, and versus like these upland areas which are higher in elevation. And so this is important because when we look, when we're trying to understand um, wetlands in regards to sea level rise, we use sediment accretion rates as an indicator as to whether these marshes are able to overcome or keep at the same, same rate as sea level rise, because if not, then they'll be um, submerged underwater or erode slowly over time. And so after I finished my master's, um, I got a job as a lab, techni lab technician uh, in a wetland ecology lab um, at Florida International University. And so there I was doing a lot of research or assisting with a lot of research in the Everglades. And so there I got the chance to work in various uh, and unique marshes and mangrove forests. And so what you see here are sawgrass marshes. And also true to its name, uh, sawgrass um, will cut you very deeply. So it's, get, it's like getting a very deep paper cut. <laughs> and so it's very hard to handle. But when we were working in these sawgrass marshes or even uh, various types of well and ecosystems in the Everglades, we were collecting water samples counting vegetation, which was always um, a really daunting task because when you're counting blades of sawgrass, um, it's like getting a paper cut every time you're counting. <laughs> um, and then we also collected vegetation and soil samples. And so with all these samples, we analyzed them for nutrient analysis, so looking at nitrogen and phosphorus. And so in the Everglades, there was a couple of different ways to travel to our research sites. Um, if the sites were close enough to the road, we would just walk through the water, um, and sometimes the water would be like up to our chest. Um, but the other mode of transportation was through airboats, which was really fun. Um, but working in these conditions, 
Um, it was very always important to hydrate. Um, and because we were taking these airboats out, we wanted to take the same path every time to reduce our footprint on the vegetation. So that's kind of why you see that narrow path in that last image. And so for the more remote locations um, that we couldn't access via airboat, um, we actually went by helicopter. And so they would pick us up in one location and then drop us off um, for maybe about an hour or two, depending on how many samples we needed to collect. And so in that first left photo you see uh, is the helicopter actually dropping us off so that we can wash ourselves from the mud. As you can see from the third photo, um, the far right, um, it was very muddy and sometimes we would sink a little bit past our knees. And that was actually during um, the dry season. But in the middle photo, you can kind of see where the helicopter would kind of land in between the mangrove shrubs. And so helicopter days were always my favorite because you got to see some of these amazing views of the Everglades. Um, but, they were, but they were one of the hardest days because they're very long and exhausting, but um, you can't beat views like this. And so what you see in these uh, views are actually red mangroves, which are slightly different species from the black mangroves I, um, I showed you earlier. And so after um, working in the Everglades for about two years, I moved on to do uh, my PhD at North Carolina State University. And so there I was focusing on coastal uh, freshwater forested wetlands uh, on the Albemarle Pamlico Peninsula. And so my research focused on ghost forests. Um, so these are freshwater wetlands, or forested wetlands that are rapidly transitioning to marshes or open water. Um, and so we call them ghost forests because the standing dead trees, or also called snags, uh, that are left remaining are reminders of what used to be there, which was a forest. And so in these two photos here, you can see, these are photos from North Carolina here, um, of ghost forests that are now open water. And so it's important to understand this transition from forest to marsh or open water. Um, or no, I'm sorry. Um, the reason for these um, ghost forests is different types of disturbances. Um, so the first disturbance um, is saltwater intrusion, and this could be drought induced. Um, so lack of precipitation or lack of fresh water inflow into some of these areas. Um, but it can also be from storm surge or wind driven. Um, but the second type of disturbance is also increasing flooding into the areas. And so as the climate changes, uh, we do expect to see an expansion uh, of ghost forests. Um, and like I was trying to say earlier, that it's important to understand the transition from forest to marsh because it means there'll be a change in ecosystem services. And so if you're not familiar with the term ecosystem services, these are things that are provided by wetlands, uh, like nutrient cycling. Um, and they provide buffers from storm surges, and they sequester a lot of carbon. So carbon is stored in the soils, and they're biomass, and there's a lot of carbon uptake through photosynthesis. And so it's important to understand or anticipate transitions from forest to marsh in order to focus our restoration efforts on areas that could still potentially be restored. And this is just a GIF, uh, an aerial image of um, some ghost forests here in North Carolina. And so my research was focused on greenhouse gas, uh, gases that are coming from the standing dead trees that are left remaining. And so the greenhouse gases that I was focused on were carbon dioxide, or CO2, methane, CH4, and nitrous oxide, which is N2O. And so these three greenhouse gases are very important to study because of their ability to absorb the sun's energy. And so kind of like, and this is what keeps the earth warmer, basically, kind of like a greenhouse traps heat, and this is why we call them greenhouse gases. And so it's important to, med to look at methane and nitrous oxide because they're way more potent greenhouse gases than CO2, and by potent, I just mean they absorb even more energy. And so methane is actually about 40 times more potent then CO2 and nitrous oxide is about 300 times more potent. Um, but it is important to know that methane and nitrous oxide are in much lower concentrations in the atmosphere. Um, and so yeah, and so we were looking at the greenhouse gases that were being emitted from the standing dead trees. And so in the middle photo that you see here, 
is a chamber that we attached to um, the, the tree stems and we basically allowed gas to be trapped inside this chamber. And then we used a portable gas analyzer, which you can see in that far right photo. Uh, the portable gas analyzer is behind my back. And this just measured the concentrations over time in order for us to measure um, a flux. And so in wetland ecosystems, um, greenhouse gases are produced in the soil just naturally. Um, and so methogenesis, this is the production of methane. And this occurs in wetlands because of the um, high water levels uh, and then constant soil saturation that it that creates a low oxygen condition. Um, and so this, is, this creates a great habitat for some microbial um, organisms that produce methane. And so nitrous oxide, um, is produced um, as a as a byproduct from incompletion of nitrification and denitrification, and so greenhouse gases produced in the soil can travel from the soil to the atmosphere in three different ways. The first is diffusion. Does this work? No. Okay. The first is diffusion, um, and this just happens when gases travel from the soil to the through the water column and then are emitted to the atmosphere and it happens so slowly so um, greenhouse gases like methane uh, can actually be converted back to CO2 and this means they're being oxidated um, and so this means it becomes a less potent greenhouse gas and so the second mode of transportation is ebullition and so this occurs in this occurs in soils when gases accumulate and they literally just bubble to the surface and the gas concentrations inside these bubbles are much higher in concentration, uh, especially methane, because it, there's no opportunity for oxidation. And the third mode of transportation is to the trees themselves. And so in live trees, um, there's a lot of soil water um, that is being taken up, that is transported to the leaves, um, and then a lot of oxygen transported back to the roots. And through these same transport mechanisms, greenhouse gases that are produced in the soil can travel up the transport mechanism and then be emitted through the sides of the tree stems. But in standing dead trees, um, a lot of this water is flushed out, and so this leaves a bunch of open cells, which allows greenhouse gases in the soil to travel up these open cells through a concentration gradient, and because of uh, differences in pressure between the soil and the atmosphere. And so in a way, we say that these standing dead trees are kind of acting as straws for gases produced in the soil. And so because um, we were measuring uh, carbon dioxide, CO2, and methane, CH4, um, these are actually the same gases that we as humans expel when we fart. And so Marcelo and I were joking, saying that we were actually measuring tree farts. Um, and this ended up being an entire 15-minute podcast. Uh, it's a children's podcast called Tumble. So if you want to look into it, just Google Tumble and do trees fart, and you can listen to it. It's very cute. <laughs> And so in addition to looking at greenhouse gases uh, from ghost forests, I was looking at ghost forests um, using satellites in space. And so in space, uh, all the, there's a couple of different satellites that have been taking, or many satellites, that have been taking images of Earth um, over time. And so these are kind of different images from what you take from your phone. And so the resolutions from the satellite I was looking at were about 30 by 30 meter resolutions. And so, um, what I wanted to see was how, how um, the vegetation has changed after disturbances. And so NDVI, the figure that you see on the left is kind of what I expected to see. Um, NDVI is just a vegetation index that's very commonly used and it basically just tells us how green a pixel area is. And so because these images have been taken over time, we can look at the same pixel over time and see when there has been disturbances, and we know that there's a disturbance because there's a decrease in greenness. And so for, for areas that we consider high resilient, this means that, we, that these areas recover fairly quickly. And so the greenness, the greenness after a disturbance goes back to the previous green level and it recovers fairly quickly. Um, but in areas that are more uh, low resilient, so these are areas that we expect to transition to a new state, um, once it experiences uh, a disturbance, 
uh, it takes a little bit longer for it to become uh, as green as it was before. And so this is an indication that, um, that that pixel area might transition to a new state. And so when looking at a pixel over time, it becomes easy. Um, what is forest versus marsh? Because forests tend to be a little bit more green in pixel versus marshes, which are green, but they tend to be a little bit more brownish. And so this is kind of what you see. This is what it would be considered a forest versus um, a marsh. And so we also wanted to look at a couple of different metrics because um, we were able to look at a time series analysis of the greenness of that pixel over time. Um, we wanted to see how the greenness varied, what the overall trend was. Um, and for highly resilient areas, these are areas that recover fairly quickly, we expected uh, the, the greenness to remain pretty stable over time versus areas that were low resilient, we expected the greenness to decline over time. But we also wanted to look at how the, that greenness varied over time. Uh, and so for this, we used a standard deviation with a moving window of 10 years. And so that means we look at the next 10 years and compare it to the previous to see how much it varied in greenness. And so for areas that recover fairly quickly, we expected that uh, standard deviation to de decline or remain pretty steady over time. And then for low resilient areas, we expected the standard deviation to increase over time because it's taking these areas a little bit longer to recover, but they might also be experiencing more disturbances. And so we were able to combine um, these uh, greenness trends, which is the NDVI, and the standard deviation trends to uh, get these four different scenarios. And the first is where you have uh, a decline in greenness, but an increase in standard deviation. And so this means that an early warning signal can be detected. And the second is where you have a decline in greenness, but also a decline in standard deviation. And this is for areas that are uh, transitioning, um, or the transition is happening very gradually, and so it, it would be really difficult to get a, a, an early warning signal. And then the third is where you have an increase in greenness, so increase in NDVI, and, but also an increase in standard deviation. And so this is areas that might be recovering from a more recent disturbance. And then the fourth is where you have an increase in greenness, but also a decrease uh, in standard deviation. And so this means that the areas are just becoming more stable over time. And so I did this on a per pixel basis across the entire peninsula. And so this is a lot of information, but um, these four colors uh, represent the four different scenarios that I just showed you. And I wanna focus in on this blue panel that you see here. This is a lot of red, and this red, these are what is considered an early warning signal where you have a decline in greenness, but also an increase in standard deviation over time. And this is actually right along the intercoastal waterway, and this is where we've seen one of the largest areas of ghost forest in this peninsula. But on the positive side, I also want to point out at this red panel here, this is actually a restored wetland where Marcelo has done a lot of research. Um, and what you see is that the majority of the, the wetland is this dark green color. And this means the area has become more green over time, and the standard deviation has decreased, which means that the, it has become, the area has become more stable over time, which is a positive indication for the restoration efforts. But what you also see is a little bit of red um, right in the middle of the uh, restored wetland. And this is actually an area where um, they've seen a lot of some forest die back because there's been a lot more flooding in the area. So it's just nice to see that the results here are kind of matching up and aligning with what we are seeing and know about the areas. And so after I finished my PhD, um, I got a postdoc with the US Geological Survey, so now I'm a research ecologist there. So this is my third cross-country move. <laughs> and um, following the same theme of uh, methane from, or greenhouse gases from tree stems. I was looking at um, methane emissions from bald cypress knees, 
And if you're not familiar, um, bald cypress knees are these um, root structures that stick out of the water, kind of like you see in the left photo. And what's kind of cool about cypress knees is uh, among the science community, there hasn't been a consensus as to what the purpose or function is of cypress knees, and I think that's just baffling. And But it also is what makes it really exciting, because anytime anybody does research work on cypress knees, it just gets people excited. Um, and so in the photo is me doing field work, um, measuring site cream or methane from cypress knees. And so kind of like the chamber for, for the tree stems, uh, I put a chamber over the cypress knee, um, and what you see in my back is a different type of portable gas analyzer called a Bacaro, and that measures uh, carbon dioxide and methane. And so after I do these measurements, I finish off with doing a LIDAR scan of each cypress knee, which is what you see on the right hand side. And I do this in order to properly calculate surface area and volume instead of just estimating. Plus, I think it also looks really cool. And so we sampled sites all along the Mississippi River. Uh, so the most furthest northern site was in Cypress Creek National Wildlife Refuge, and the most southern site was uh, Cat Island in Louisiana National Wildlife Refuge. And uh, we sampled them this way because we wanted to have a different um, differences in climatic gradients and also differences in hydrology. And so as you can, as you can see from some of these photos, um, some sites are more wetter than others, but this is just one snapshot in time. Um, as you can see from this photo here, um, the water line is actually all the way up here, and so this is a, a low water level for the sampling period. Um, so I'm actually still analyzing the results from this because I just finished uh, last month or two months ago, but I'm excited to see where, where it goes. But one of the other projects that I'm also working on is looking at um, mangrove damage from an extreme, extreme freeze event that happened last February. And if you're not familiar with this freeze event, it was pretty extreme and it made a lot of national news headlines. So major cities like Dallas and Houston experienced uh, major power outages. Um, there was a lot of snow in places that don't, actually, don't ever really receive snow. Um, so it was a pretty historical event. Um, but I'm looking at the mangrove damage from this uh, freeze event. And so I'm, if you're not familiar with mangroves, well, I did show you photos of mangroves. These are black mangroves, um, which are tropical species. Um, so they're very temperature sensitive because they're not, they don't really, they're not accustomed to extreme, um, extremely low temperatures. And so I like these two photos because it shows one, um, how sensitive mangroves are to, minimum, to low temperatures, but also just how extreme this event was. And so this is for a site in Port Aransas, um, which is indicated by the star here. And it's right along the coastal bend. And so the one on the left, the photo on the left, is uh, the black mangroves a few days, I think it's like five days after the freeze. And so these leaves used to be like kind of this dark green color, um, and now they're pretty brown, and they fell off pretty quickly. And then a year later, there's been very little recovery, which is what you see on the right photo. And so once again, I was able to use uh, satellite images um, to assess the, uh, the damage uh, at the landscape scale. Once again, using this metric called NDVI, which tells me how green a pixel area is. And so I was just literally looking at how the, the, the green has changed um, from one year to the next. And what you see in the more red areas are the greatest damage, uh, where some of the yellow areas are actually an increase in greenness, but these are areas that weren't actually mangroves, but they were misclassified. But what was really cool about this study is that we were able to put some, some numbers behind it and say what the total damage was and where it occurred. And um, the greatest damage was in Port Aransas and Port O'Connor. Um, and this was actually only because there was more mangroves present to be affected. Um, so in the last few decades, there hasn't been an extreme freeze event in Texas, and this has allowed tropical species like mangroves to go move, move um, further north uh, because, because there hasn't been a freeze event to um, reduce their range expansion. And so because of that, they've expanded greatly uh, 
in these two regions, but this freeze event has now um, most likely killed off a lot of these mangroves. And so if you have any questions on anything that I've presented today, um, please feel free to email me. Um, or if you have any questions about grad school, I know we talked about that with a few other students. Um, you can also feel free to email me about that too. So, that's it. So now, it's Dr. Marcelo Rado. Thank you. Um, thank you all for coming out tonight. Um, thank you again uh, to Dr. Stutz and the organizing committee for inviting me tonight. And uh, thank you, Dr. Schwab, for that wonderful introduction. So um, they invited me to come and talk to you about uh, ghost forests. And whenever I talk about ghost forests, I like to tell people how I got interested in ghost forests, because it wasn't something that I really knew about until I actually started working. So, in fact, the reason why I started working in this has to do with Meredith College, um, but I'll tell you that a little bit later. So I started working as a postdoc at Duke in a restored wetland out in the coast of North Carolina. So this is a picture of what the site looked like when I started working on it. They planted 750,000 trees across, across 1,000 acres and they were restoring it back into the wetland. So we were looking at the water quality from this side, we were looking at the trees, and the trees were growing like gangbusters because in part there were legacy fertilizers in those soils, but because it was a restored wetland, we went around looking for other mature wetlands nearby that we thought eventually this restored wetland is going to look like this, right? So, so these were our reference, or if you want to think about it, these were our control wetlands. And what we noticed over the research was that the restored wetland was doing great. The trees were growing like crazy, but our control wetlands were not doing that well. The trees were dying, they were losing their leaves, the canopy was opening up. In some instances, there was marsh vegetation that was coming in, and in other instances, the whole forest was being swallowed by the water. And so that's what got me interested in, you know, we realized after spending time in these ecosystems that other people were calling these ghost forests. And so that got us interested in what's causing these changes? How many places are undergoing this change, right? Like, so what's the spatial extent of this area? And what are the consequences? What might mean if a forested wetland turns into a marsh? Or what, might, what does it mean when a forested wetland gets swallowed by the open water? And so we've spent about the last decade working on these systems, trying to get some answers to these questions. So here are some of more pictures of these systems. Um, I, should, I should actually get a picture from the highway, because if you drive out to the outer banks, you see these systems. If you drive out to Wilmington, you drive past these systems. Uh, if you drive around Beaufort and Moorhead City, you drive past these kinds of systems. And so I've been talking a lot about these, these kinds of ecosystems. You know, the, the ghost forest name makes sense, right? These dead trees kind of look white and spooky. This kind of fits in with this Halloween idea. And, and I've been talking about these things so much that I think I've started to influence the decoration that my neighbors are putting out for, for Halloween. And so in terms of what might be causing these things, we know that sea levels are rising. So these are just two graphs. The one closer to me has to do with historical rates of sea level rise. So these are tide gauges. These are measurements that people have gone out and measure the water level over time. And we know how much it's increased. The graph on the left are projections of how much sea level might uh, rise going into 2100. These are projections from the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Cam uh, Panel on Climate Change. What we're learning is that these projections might be underestimates and that sea levels might be rising faster than we had expected. And so if we bring it down here to North Carolina, we wanted to know, well, what's, what is it doing here in North Carolina? So one thing we were interested in was salinity. So we went out and tried to collect as much salinity data as we could. 
data that other people had collected. So we were synthesizing other people's data and we graphed it out. And so here is salinity going back to 1960. And there's a lot of noise in the data, as you can see. But what you can notice is that if we put a trend line there, there's a slow increase of salinity over the, you know, the last four decades, five decades. Um, there's a lot of noise, so there are spikes. So we've seen that when there are droughts, sometimes the salinity goes way up. Um, also, when there are storms, the salinity can sometimes go up, but sometimes go down, depending on whether the storm is a hurricane, whether the hurricane came on land or went through the water. So all of these things vary, but overall that you can see that there's an increasing salinity trend. So on the top here, there's a graph in the 1970s, uh, there were lower salinity, the 2010s, there were higher salinities. These red colors show you that the salinities have been increasing in the Abermel and the Pamlico Sound. So these are salinities that then are going onto the land and affecting the trees and the wetlands and are slowly killing these trees. We also know that a lot of this landscape has ditches and drains. So all of these ditches and drains were put in so that we could do agriculture in this area. These ditches and drains are very good at moving the water off of the landscape, but then they can also help facilitate the movement of salinity into the landscape. And what we've seen is that the places where the highest density of ditches are the places that have the highest vulnerability to salinity. So these are the places where we see higher salinities, more frequent salinity episodes. And so, you know, we are interested, well, what are the consequences? Bald cypress trees are very common out in this area, and we know they're uh, tolerant of flooding, and they can also be tolerant of salinity, but we wanted to know just how tolerant they are. And so this is where uh, Miss Amanda Powell came to do my master, uh, her master's research with me. And what I always joke is that she hugged and dated trees for her masters. Um, and, and literally, that's what she did. She went around hugging trees, and then she would take cores of the tree rings, bring back the tree rings so that she could age and date those trees. And here's some of her data. What you can see is that the growth of trees, so this is actually data from a restored wetland where we knew exactly when the trees had been planted and they had all been planted at the same time and we knew their salinity history and we saw that both the DDH, so the growth at the diameter, had uh, been less in the higher salinity places and the height was also, so the trees that were in high salinity areas were half as tall as the trees that were in the higher salinity areas. So this is from one site, we wanted to know, well, what's happening in other sites? So these are two studies from uh, some of my colleagues, and I don't have time to explain all that they did, but they try to estimate how much ghost forests have increased in this Abermile Pentanico Peninsula of North Carolina. And they used two different methods, and they came up with very similar numbers. So both of them found that about 167 square kilometers had been formed of ghost forests between 2001 and 2014, and about 193 square kilometers within a certain time period, 1990 to 2019. Now, to put that number into context, Washington, D.C. has an area of about 171 square kilometers. So in this area of North Carolina, in the last three decades, we've seen an area the size of Washington, D.C., of new ghost forests that, that were formed. So we also were interested in what are the consequences, right? So wetlands are very good at sequestering carbon. That's an ecosystem service that we depend on and that we are going to continue to depend on because we need to take out carbon from the atmosphere to minimize the problems associated with climate change. So another master's student working with me, Jillian Gunderson, um, she loves to get to the core of the problem. So she went around collecting lots of soil cores and we took him to the lab and we used lead and cesium to date the cores and then we could estimate how much carbon these systems accumulate. People doing research in other sites in Georgia had found that marshes sequester more carbon than forests. And that's what you can see in these two columns right here. The marsh sequestered more carbon than the forest. What we found here in North Carolina was the opposite. We found that the forest 
sequester more carbon than the marsh. So if people often ask me, well, is the creation of ghost forests a good thing or a bad thing? So if the ghost forest turns into a marsh, in Georgia, that's a good thing. If what you care about is only carbon, because those marshes are going to sequester more carbon. But here in North Carolina, it's really not that, the marshes are not doing any better than the forest. So we are going to lose that ecosystem service. We also did that for nitrogen and similar. What we found was different than what, we had, what they had found in Georgia. So the answer to whether these ghost forests are a good thing or a bad thing might depend on where you are in the landscape. We also wanted to um, try to estimate, okay, let's say all of these ghost forests turn into marshes, right? We know how much, we can estimate how much biomass, how much carbon is stored in those trees. So if all these forests turn into marshes, how long would it take those marshes, which are good at sequestering carbon, to capture that carbon back into their soils? And I don't have to ex time to explain how we calculated that, but the answer is that it could take 200 to 600 years for these marshes to sequester the amount of carbon that is right now stored in those streets. Unfortunately, these marshes do not have 200 to 600 years, because in that time, sea levels are going to be, you know, two to three meters higher than what they are now. So they're going to be underwater. So we don't have that kind of time. So it's a lot of negative things, right? So, so changing these ecosystems is not always a good thing. But it can be a good thing sometimes. We've also worked with some colleagues that worked on birds. And birds love the ghost forests, particularly wood um, cavity nesting birds, like woodpeckers, love the ghost forests. For some animals, it's a good thing, right? So we also are interested in trying to find what are the opportunities, what are the solutions that we can provide to these uh, growing ghost forests. So one way to do it is to try to identify areas that are vulnerable and that are already changing and trying to identify areas that might be resilient. Um, and also, you know, we've done a lot of work here in North Carolina. We've also been trying to do work in other areas. So I've been using data that is collected by the Forest Service. They have this huge program where they measure trees all over the country. Um, it's the forest inventory analysis. So this is a map of dead standing trees, so the snags. And you can see that there's hot spots in Louisiana. We have a hot spot here in North Carolina, but there are other areas. So we're also trying to explain, well, what, what explains those hot spots? Is it the rate of sea level rise that is being measured in these different sites? Or is it the number of storms? So we've mapped out the storms that have gone by there and we can look at how many big storms came next to close to these areas. Um, so Melinda has done some really cool work taking remote sensing and building the trajectories of change of these systems. So rather than just saying, is it a ghost forest, yes or no, it's like, well, how green is it this year, and is the next year greener or less green, browner, or how is it changing? And like she explained, by combining those trajectories, we can identify places that are getting greener and we don't want to do anything there, versus places, places that are getting browner and we might want to go in and try to do restoration, put water control structures, um, and try to prevent them from turning into forests or places that have already gone so far that maybe all we want to do is let them turn into a marsh and have a marsh right there because those are also um, beautiful ecosystems. So with this idea also of doing restoration and interested in, in uh, the ecosystem services that we provide, we also partnered with the Nature Conservancy and the U.S. and Fish and Wildlife Service, and they've been doing restoration for a lot of wetlands, particularly Pocosins, which is a, a special type of shrub wetlands that you find here in North Carolina. And they were doing a restoration, and so we said, oh, could we come in and measure the greenhouse gases before you do the restoration and after you do the restoration to see if there are any benefits? And what we found was that when they raised the water table, 
the amount of CO2 that was coming out of the soils from this wetlands decreased by 58%. And now they've also have a methodology where by doing this restoration, since we've de documented that there's decrease in the CO2 emissions, then they can generate carbon credits that can be sold and generate funds that can fuel or you know, help support uh, restoration in other sites. Another opportunity that we see from these ghost forests, you know, you were illustrating this right here. The name ghost forest is clever. People are like, what is that? Uh, you know, they want to learn more about it. So we're trying to engage citizen, citizens into a citizen science project. So we've installed these kinds of stations um, where you put a little, uh, a little kind of brace or, or a plaque where people can come and put their phone there and take pictures of the same areas over time. And then they email them to us and this website automatically starts building a time-lapse series of the same area. And so we can see the change over time. And people can see the change, they can contribute to it, and they can go to the website and see the change themselves. Our idea is that eventually we're going to use this for classroom curriculum so that teachers can bring this into the classroom and show it to students and have the students work for that as well. So remember at the beginning I told you that, that me working on Ghost Forest had something to do with Meredith College as well. And it did because one of the main reasons that I originally moved to North Carolina was because I got the postdoc at Duke, but I got the postdoc at Duke because my wife, Erin Lindquist, had a job here at Meredith College. And she got the job before I got the job, so I was following her. And I loved trees before I met Erin, but she really loved trees. She was definitely a, a professional tree hugger. Um, and, you know, she loved showing students her love for trees and, and you know, it's great, to, you know, today I spent so many, so much time talking to students and students were saying that, there was one student saying that she took Miss Powell's class and that made her love uh, trees and now that's what she wants to study. Well, Miss Powell took a class with Erin and really loved trees and so it's great for me to see that her legacy is still um, shining here at Meredith. So Erin was a professor here from 2006 through 2019. So unfortunately in 2012, when, after she gave birth to our second child, she was diagnosed with stage four cervical cancer. At the time when it, she was diagnosed, she was given a 5% chance to live five years after diagnosis. She lived for seven years after diagnosis. And during that time, she continued teaching, she continued working, she continued working with students. Um, this is, you know, we took, we, this was before cancer, she would take students to Costa Rica, but she started that Costa Rica course, and that Costa Rica course is still going. Uh, so I think that's great that her legacy is, is still going on. Um, but, you know, in the similar way that these ghost forests are facing change, and uh, facing hard conditions. Erin, you know, was facing change, was facing hard conditions, and she kept working through it. She kept being resilient, and she kept, uh, you know, with grace and, and honor, and always with a smile on her face. She kept doing what she wanted to do because it was her passion. She kept working with students here. And, you know, you guys, Meredith has this, this uh, logo right of this is what, what strong looks like is what you guys have those, those things around. So to me, this is what strong looks like. So this is Erin getting chemo after she had taught that day. And there she is probably working on a lecture or grading papers. It was around Halloween, so she was wearing that colorful uh, lab coat and, and, and the, the colorful wig, and she was smiling, right? She was right there getting chemo and working and, and, and continuing to move forward. And so, you know, when they invited me to come and talk about Ghost Forest, I said, yes, I'm going to talk about Ghost Forest. And they also said it would also be great if you talk about Erin. And this is really hard for me, right? Like, I miss her every single day of my, you know, the past three years. She passed away three years ago. 
Um, my kids miss her every single day. Um, but it is my duty to keep telling her story and keep giving you the kind of advice that she would have given you if she was here so that you can keep doing this. So I am going to give you unsolicited advice, and this is what I think she would have told you if she was still here teaching you classes. So to start over by admitting that you know college is hard, right? College is both the best time and the worst time of your life. Um, but guess what? Um, sorry, uh, animations. Life just gets harder. <laughs> So if you think things are hard now, just, just wait, because it, it, it's going to continue to get harder. Um, but, but that shouldn't be depressing. That should just give you freedom that, that, that you need to keep working. And it doesn't matter how hard things get. You have to stay optimistic, because that's the only way that you can keep putting one foot in front of another and you can keep showing up. 90% of life is just showing up. Being optimistic, you know, we faced cancer for seven years, and I swear to you that Aaron was optimistic up until the last point, okay? And it was really hard, but being optimistic was the only way we could face that, and it was the only way that our kids could face that, and it's the only way that we keep facing every day. Be kind. Be kind to yourself, be kind to your classmates, be kind to your world, be kind to trees. If you see them, hug them, okay? <laughs> so it's always important to be kind. Somebody was asking me today about, you know, if I think people are going to start caring about the world. I think we are going to start caring about the world because I think humans inherently are kind. It's been kind of beaten out of us and, and, and maybe we've forgotten, but I know people can be kind and I know you all can do it and you need to be doing it. Be persistent. School is hard, life is harder, but just keep trying and keep putting in your best effort and keep doing what you can. And have fun. It's too hard if you don't laugh enough. You should try to laugh at least five times a day what is it, try to get 12 hugs a day? I tell my kids these days and I go and hug them all the time because it is too hard and we have to have fun and yes, you have to hug each other. Thank you for illustrating because it, it is too hard and the things that we need to do to fight the spread of ghost forests, the things that we need to do to fight climate change, it's going to be really hard but we have to do it. And you guys are really smart and really capable, and you're going to be able to do it. But be optimistic, be kind, be persistent, and have fun. All right, so summary. Um, ghost forests are increasing due to climate change. We might not be able to recover that carbon in, in enough time. Um, the filter straws, Melinda talked about that. And I always tell people that climate change should be a call to action because they're an indication that climate change is here and it's happening now, but it is not an indication that it is too late. It will never be too late because this is all something that anything we do to minimize the negative impacts are going to be great, it's going to be good, and it's going to make it easier in the long run um, and for those that come after. And I think that's all I have. Yep. Thank you. And I think now we move to the question and answer.
guests to answer some questions from you, the audience. You'll see a microphone at each outer aisle, and please approach the nearest microphone if you'd like to ask a question, and I'll acknowledge each speaker in turn as you approach. And if you're employed, please share your name and address your question to one or both of the speakers. Um, and after the Q&I time closes, we invite all of you to Johnson Hall Rotunda for a light reception and a chance to continue our conversation. Uh, so let the questions begin. Um, I know you mentioned a project to get citizens involved with this. Um, do you have any recommendations as people that clearly now care um, what we could do as just regular people to help with this project? Yeah, so the citizen science, I, so I mentioned, I showed the map really quickly. So there's um, like 16, mostly out on the coast, um, most state parks, but some of them are wildlife refuges. Um, so if you see these, stations, if you're out walking around there and, and taking pictures and, and um, take pictures and contribute, and so that's a very direct way that you can contribute to the research. I think in general, you know, talk about this, right? So talking about climate change is the way that we're going to get more people to care about this. And so now that you have search images of these things, when you're driving out to the coast, if you see them, point them out, maybe point them out to your partner, your kids, your parents, whoever you're with, because the more awareness we can have, the more we can get people to, to help. some ways like there's this kind of swing right in terms of how do we talk about climate change and I think in some ways the, the, the way that people that we've tried to get people to care is by scaring them and, and to some degree like yes it's scary like the things that can happen can be really scary but that doesn't mean we shouldn't act and I think we need more positive stories and we need more, yeah, like restoration, more of the, what I, in my class I always talk about win-win situations. So stories of things that help us fight climate change and help make life better for people. And there's plenty of stories of that, but we don't hear as many of those. And so learning about those kinds of stories and sharing them and spreading them is what makes me hopeful and um, kind of why I do this kind of work. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
I will add, I just recently started following an Instagram account that literally all they do is share positive climate change news stories, and I think I really like that account. <laughs> I wish I could remember what it was called, but maybe I can send, send it somewhere else. Sorry, I had a question. Um, so, Melinda, you were talking about the black shrubs in Texas. I don't remember the second name. It started with an M. What are those called? Mangroves. Mangroves, thank you. So, I know that there was the big freeze like two years ago, a year ago, and there was another freeze this past winter. Do you think that there could be any recovery of the black mangrove, especially in those areas that have been freezed over? Yeah, so I've actually driven by um, that area in Port Aransas um, fairly recently uh, in August because I had a conference there. But as I was driving, I almost didn't even realize that's where mangroves used to be because there was just so much brown, like from the just the shrub that's standing dead mangroves. And it took me a while to realize, like, oh, this was this all used to be mangroves. Um, there has been some recovery, but I think the freeze is just so bad that it's likely that it was um, mortality all the way down to the roots. And so now the concern for that region is that there might be some soil erosion or like a shoreline erosion happening because if there isn't enough um, roots to stabilize the sediments, then you have a lot of erosion happening. And a lot of these mangroves are right on the fringe of the shoreline. So what they're seeing is collapse of mangroves just toppling over. And so I think what the next few steps is trying to figure out what sort of restoration efforts should actually take place. And I think that's why these um, landscape scale mangrove damage maps are useful for land managers so they can see like where is the damage the greatest. And you said that the mangrove damage happened in northern areas where it was like growing beyond its like normal places. Are those normal places where they usually grow also being affected by the freezes? Are, the, are the places that the mangroves usually grow being affected by like the new storm winters, the harsher winters? Uh, okay, so with mangroves, there's kind of this weird dynamic between mangroves and salt marsh grasses uh, because over time, oh, so mangroves have been in Texas for probably millennial millennia um, kind of expanding and contracting back and forth based on like how how many freeze events or how extreme that freeze event is um, and so because there hasn't been that many freeze events in the last few like in the last 30 years in Texas they've just been basically expanding their range and kind of taking over some of the same areas where marsh grasses are and some of the people in Texas don't actually like this and they consider mangroves as invasive species um, because one of the reasons is um, they like their marsh grasses for various reasons because it is a different type of ecosystem but also the endangered whooping crane heavily favors marsh grasses and dislikes shrubs um, and so I think in that dynamic um, when you talk about restoration efforts people don't want to actually replant mangroves they're wanting to plant uh, marsh grasses instead. Thank you. And we have another question over at the side now. Hi, um, my name's Alexis. I can't remember if this question was already addressed or not, but I was wondering, like, why is it that mangroves are the most prevalent in ghost forests? Is it just because they're, um, do you mean, so mangroves are actually, they're not in North Carolina. I think when we're talking about ghost forests for this talk, we're focusing on freshwater forested wetlands. Okay. Um, but mangroves are more of a salt marsh type um, woody shrub. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you. <laughs> question for Melinda, your favorite. I was wondering if there uh, were any other metrics that you considered for resiliency besides just greenness. Um, yeah, NDVI is kind of, which is the greenness index. Um, that's like the golden standard. It has been for a long time, but there are other vegetation indexes that kind of use um, the presence of water 
um, as a different vegetation index, but for my research, I only used the NPI one. Cool, thanks. I think when you're doing this type of analysis at the landscape scale, um, it takes a really long time to run the analysis, which is why you do, I did it on a high performance computer, so I was just thinking like, okay, I just need to do one index because it took like two days to run even on the high performance computer. So if I wanted to test other ones, it was just a lot more. <laughs> So I, I think your question was about like what species yeah. might be good to, to have in these areas. Absolutely. Yeah, and so we've done some of that research, and we've done some of that research in that we've gone out to that, that whole peninsula and done lots of vegetation surveys to figure out which species grow where and look at the soil salinity and the salinity nearby to see what species grow. And so from that, we have a good list of all the species that are there. We have their uh, salinity tolerance. And so we know kind of which species can grow under high salinity, which species can grow under kind of like medium salinity. And so that's kind of like step one. But what you're talking about also in terms of like, well, what species might make sense to grow there in, in the future, um, so that gets a little bit more challenging. For one thing, it's like some of these species can adapt, right? So some species might become more salt tolerant if they're exposed to it enough. So we don't know that very well. Um, and then the other part is like, okay, we don't quite know the trajectory of the places itself. So in some ways, it's like some people who do this research, like instead of saying calling it restoration, it's kind of like what do they call it? It's like future, <laughs> like not pre-storation, like it's, it's trying to anticipate what's going to happen rather. So I guess an extreme example could be like, well, what we should do is go out and plant mangroves all over this place, right? And that's an extreme example. Um, be a few decades it'll be a few decades before the, the mangroves. But, um, but that's definitely something that, that we need more research on, is figuring out what species would be the best ones to use for restoration of the Yeah, so some of the sites that I've worked on, um, like I showed the graph that I talked about where it decreased the, the amount of CO2 and is related to their carbon credits. So that restoration was an area that already had vegetation growing, wetland vegetation. So that one, all that it entailed was they put in water control structures and they built a berm to kind of hold the water for a little bit longer. So that one, it was a large area, but it wasn't very manipulative. The first restoration site that I mentioned, that one was an agricultural field. So it had been pretty beaten up as an agricultural field. 
And so that one required, like, they plugged ditches, they moved the land around. It was, there was a huge pump that was there that would drain the whole site. So they took the pump out to allow the water to kind of come back in. And so there's been kind of a range, depending on how degraded the system was, of how much restoration they, they've had to do. So I didn't mention this anecdote, but I mentioned it today during the day. When I started working in one of these sites, like I used to wear boots that came up to my knee, like rubber boots, right? And then the water got deeper and the trees were dying, and so then I had to start wearing hip waders. And then it got so wet that I had to wear chest waders. And then we had to abandon one of the sites. So it was kind of the thing where I was like, I didn't set out to study this, but it just like hit me in the face. And, and, and it took me a while to realize, I'll be honest. Like, same thing with the saltwater intrusion. It took us like a year to realize it was happening, even though we should have, we had the data. But, um, so, I, in fact, I remember when I started studying the wetland restoration, I met with somebody from the Nature Conservancy. And he's like, so, have you considered how sea level rise could affect your site? And I was like, oh, no. I was like, we're too far away. It won't affect it. And then we were having saltwater intrusion, right? It was related to drought, but it's also related to the fact that because sea levels are rising, the sand is getting saltier. So in some ways, it was kind of like, it kept knocking on my door, and I was like, okay, I, I have to start looking at this and, 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 um, and studying and, and, and try to understand it. Um, and so the more we do it, the more I realized, well, you know, this, this could be a very good example of climate change and a good way to reach a broader audience. I know that you had mentioned that the marshes in Georgia sequester more carbon than the forests, but the opposite is true here in North Carolina. Can you say like why that would be? Oh, uh, that's a great question. I wish I knew the answer. Um, <laughs> so I think part of it is that the marshes in Georgia receive a lot of sediments, while the marshes here, because of where they are and the elevation and the fact that there's dams, they don't receive as much sediments. So one reason we think is that the marshes here are sediment starved. Um, I don't know if you saw, there was also uh, some other data from South Carolina that was more similar to ours. And, and I don't know, maybe the marshes in Georgia are just like mighty marshes? I don't know. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. 
These are great questions. Thank you very much. Well, I think maybe we should move our conversation over to Johnson Hall Rotunda, where you can grab a, a light refreshment, and our speakers will come along and be available to continue talking to you. Uh, if you didn't think of your question yet, or you just didn't want to walk up to the microphone, it's a little bit more personal to, to ask your question in person. Thank you all for coming tonight. Um, we're really appreciative of your support for the event, and we really want to thank Dr. Ardon and Dr. Martinez again.